Hello and welcome to lecture 47 of the course Computational Complexity. In this lecture and the next, we will see what are uh, called promise problems. Promise problems are a generalization of languages and for a specific promise problem called unique set, we will see the, uh, we will see the complexity of the unique set. Right? So to begin, uh, let me ask this question, does BPP have a complete problem? Right, the complexity class BPP and this leads to the definition of uh, or two classes called syntactic and semantic classes or two class of classes right okay so suppose you have a Turing machine M that is a deterministic polynomial time Turing machine suppose it's a deterministic polynomial time Turing machine so I'm only talking about deciders then there is naturally a class of languages or class of strings that it accepts and everything else it rejects. So there is a language LM, all the strings in LM it accepts and all the strings not in LM it rejects. Right? So given the machine M, it's deterministic to the machine, it, it's a decider, there is a set of strings that it accepts and that, that set of strings is the language decided by this Turing machine. Similarly for a, a non-deterministic Turing machine, we could draw a computation tree like, a, like I have drawn on the right hand side right and we could look at the set of strings that have at least one accepting path so this something like there is one accepting computation these are the set of strings accepted by this turing machine n right this is, this is how a non deterministic turing machine decides uh, or accepts a string similarly we could uh, so we could uh, form a set of strings that are accepted by this non deterministic turing machine we can call it ln which is a class of strings that are that have at least one accepting path. Now, instead of a deterministic or a non deterministic machine, what if we are given a probabilistic machine, right? Let us say we want this probabilistic Turing machine to be a BPP decider, right? So, given a deterministic or non deterministic Turing machine, whatever be that machine, there is a set of, as long as it is a decider, there is a set of strings that it accepts, set of strings that it Rest, does not accept. So, everything that it accepts, the rest of it it does not accept. Right? There is nothing in between. Whereas, if we have a probabilistic Turing machine, let us say we want it to be a BPP decider. So, you may recall the definition for BPP. Suppose L is in, we say L is in BPP. If X is in the language L, as I have highlighted here, then the, the BPP machine for L should accept X with probability two thirds, right? And if X is not in L, the, the BPP machine should accept X with probability at most one thirds, right? So there is a gap between the probability of strings, uh, the acceptance probability of strings in the language L and the acceptance and the, and the strings that are not in the language L, right? The problem is that if I just give you a Turing machine, a probability Turing machine, it may not meet this. So, what we ideally want is all the strings either should ac get accepted with probability more than two thirds or get accepted with probability less than one thirds. So, there is nothing in between, right? Only then it is a BPP decider. Only then can we say that this Turing machine, this probabilistic Turing machine, is a BP de BPP decider for some language. But if I just give you a BPP uh, probabilistic Turing machine, it could accept strings with probability say 0.45. Now, what, where do we put that, that particular string? Is it, is it supposed to be in the language or is it supposed to be outside the language, right? So, there is this gap may not be there, right? Because it is just a probabilistic Turing machine. This issue is not there if the underlying Turing machine was a deterministic or a non deterministic Turing machine, right? So, for a Turing machine to be a BPP decider, we need some extra requirements, right? So, and uh, how do we decide whether a given Turing machine has this property? If I give a, a Turing machine, a probabilistic Turing machine and can we say that this corresponds to a language or in other words, can we say that this, there is a set of strings for which it accepts with probability two thirds, at least two thirds and all the remaining strings it accepts with probability at most one thirds, right? So is there such a set of strings? So the answer for this is so the answer for this is that it, this particular problem is undecidable. 
you may have you may recall from a theory of computation you may have seen this theorem called rises theorem which states that it is undecidable given a turing machine it's undecidable to determine whether it has a certain property so in this case the property that we are asking is is there some string that gets accepted with probability more than one third but less than two thirds right so this is a property of the Turing machine and it is undecidable to determine that. Right? Rice's theorem was stated for uh, I think deterministic Turing machines but then we can modify it accordingly to show that even this problem is undecidable. Right? So because of this, uh, because of this now given a Turing machine, uh, a probabilistic Turing machine, we cannot say whether it accepts a BPP language or it, it accept, it's a BPP decider for a language. Okay, so again we started with the question does BPP have a complete problem, so we are coming to that. So for classes like NP, right, there is a natural uh, very trivial NP complete problem. So we could simply ask given a Turing machine, given a non-deterministic Turing machine n, does this not uh, Turing machine n and a string x and time t, does this non-deterministic Turing machine n accept the string x in time t right and this is something that uh, the, the, it is a cl class of all uh, triplets n t and x such that n accepts x in t steps right and this kind of trivial np complete language and and you can easily show that this is an np complete problem okay so i think more formally i think one has to uh, write it like this maybe i'll write it here uh, so L, sorry, let's say L is a set of all N, X and this has to be written in unary such so that N accepts X in T steps or less. And it can be shown that this is NP complete. It's, it's very easy to see that it is an NP. And basically any other language, uh, NP language, you can reduce to this. So if you want to uh, decide if X is in some N language A, and suppose A is an NP language, then you take the Turing machine, not deterministic Turing machine that corresponds to A, and uh, let's say that is NA, and you can input NA and X in uh, a polynomial uh, time and asks whether it accepts. So again, anyway, I leave it for you to check that this is indeed NP complete. The, the clue is that it is very straightforward. I, 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 I almost told you how, uh, uh, how to prove it, it's just that the details have to be written down and verified. But the problem is, this is an NP complete language. Now, we cannot write a similar BPP complete problem because uh, the, 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 the problem of deciding whether a given Turing machine is a BPP decider, even that is not, not decidable or not computable, right? So we cannot write a similar problem that is BPP complete, right? So, so as of now, it's not clear how to get a language that is BPP complete. You can, so we will, if you go to promise problem, there is a way to uh, write a BPP complete promise problem. But anyway, as a language, a language is just a subset of sigma star, where sigma is the alphabet. We cannot write a language that is BPP complete. And this brings us to the definition of, again, I'm not writing a formal definition, but the classification of syntactic and semantic classes. Syntactic classes are those uh, classes for which when you give a Turing machine or a Turing machine representation, there is an automatically the Turing machine corresponds to a language. Like I said for P, N, P, etc. Given a Turing machine that runs in deterministic polynomial time, there is a language associated with it. Whereas for RP, BPP, given a Turing machine, it is not clear whether it is an RP decider. It is not clear whether it is an R BPP decider. Sem uh, so se semantic classes are those for which we this a, a, a Turing machine by default need not be a decider for that class. Whereas syntactic, any Turing machine that is deterministic will be uh, and a decider will be a, uh, will decide a language. So same for NP and same for P space. 
and if you think about it it is the same for pp as well right because um, pp pp there is no gap so with prob probability greater than or equal to half you accept and maybe strictly less than half you reject so any string no matter with whatever probability it, it is accepted by the turing machine it uh, whatever probability it is accepted it is either corresponding to it is in the language or not in the language because there is no gap so strictly greater than strictly less than half is not in the language and greater than or equal to half is in the language so even pp is a syntactic class so syntactic class are those for which a given Turing machine can be immediately, you can immediately look at the Turing machine and tell, okay, this is the correct type and so there is a language associated with it. Whereas semantic, you cannot do that because in addition to being of the correct type, there are some additional restrictions or additional conditions that it has to satisfy. Right? So, so, so as defined, BPP does not have complete languages. Uh, well, um, there is, um, Unless BPP is equal to, let's say, turns out that BPP is equal to P, then there may be some complete languages, right? There is something called P complete that we have not seen in this course, um, but there is a notion under a uh, reasonably suitably defined reduction. Okay, so now let me come to the promise problem. What is a promise problem? So as we saw in the case of BPP, we not only required uh, the, the Turing machine to be probabilistic, but we also required that the Turing machine either accepts all strings above a certain probability or below a certain probability and that we needed a gap, right? So this brings us to what is called promise problem. So we ask the question, what do you do when a string is get, gets accepted with probability in between, right? So promise problem is a way to uh, remove some inputs that are not of interest to us. So till now we have seen languages and promise problems are generalizations of languages. Uh, so a language is like we have in the in the left side, right? It's a it's a subset of sigma star. So this entire thing is sigma star. Everything that is in the language we have marked with L, and everything that is not L is is not L. Whereas in the case of a promise problem. We have a class of inputs for which we want to say yes and we have another class of inputs for which we want to say no. Obviously these two classes must be disjoint. There is no input for which we want to say both. But the point is that this, this yes, the, the set of yes strings and the set of no strings, these two must be disjoint but these two need not cover the entire set of strings. Right. So, these two need not cover the entire string or set of strings. There could be strings that are neither in uh, the yes class nor in no class. Okay. So, a promise problem is just the, def the, the classes, the yes class and the no class. So, I have written pi yes and pi no, right, such that two properties are satisfied. First is that they are disjoint pi yes and pi no and second is that both of them are subsets of sigma star. Right, which is obviously the case in this figure and it is not a requirement that pi s and pi no together form sigma star. There could be other uh, other strings that are neither in pi s nor in pi no, but we for these these inputs we do not care. Right? So we say that a Turing machine M decides this promise, uh, promise problem right? if it correctly decides on pi s and pi no. So for all inputs in pi yes, it m should accept. For all inputs in pi no, m should reject. Okay. We don't care what m does on the other things. So there is a don't care uh, situation happening here. We don't care how m behaves on the remaining strings that are neither in pi s nor in pi no. Right. So we could define something called promise BPP. Okay. Promise BPP are the set of those languages, those promise problems for which there is a BPP machine that decides it. And similarly, you can define promise P, you can define promise NP and so on, right? So a promise BPP is a, is a promise problem, a promise problem for which there is a BPP machine that decides it. So all the strings that are in pi s, the BPP machine accepts with probability two, thir two thirds or more. All the strings that are in pi no, the BPP machine accepts with probability at most one third. 
right? And uh, so just give, to give one example, which we will also see the complexity of, consider the problem unique set, or sometimes it's shortened as U set, right? Okay. So this is the class of uh, Boolean formula that have at exactly one satisfying assignment. So suppose I give you, a, so till now we have seen satisfiability. Satisfiability means we have to, given a string, given a formula, we have to decide whether there is a satisfying assignment or not. The satisfying assignment, it could be one assignment, it could be 10 assignments, it could be millions of assignments. We just have to decide is the number of satisfying assignments at least one versus is, is it zero. So is it zero or not zero is what we have to determine in the case of satisfiability. In the case of unique set, the problem comes with a promise. Okay, So this is why again this is why it is called promise problem. We are told that the given formula either has no satisfying assignment or has exactly one satisfying assignment. So it, it will not happen that this problem has this formula has 2 or 10 or 100 or something. Right? It will have either 1 or 0 and then we have to determine whether which of the two cases does it belong to. Right? So now you see that it could be potentially simpler because the, the, the difficulty in SAT perhaps presumably could have been because there is the satisfiable class itself has so many like it could have one, it could have two, it could have thousand, it could have millions and so on that many satisfying assignments. Whereas in the case of unique SAT either it is zero or one we know that the given formula is this or that. Now can this potentially make the problem easier that is one question that we may ask right. So just to complete the formal definition, U set yes is the set of all Boolean formula that has exactly one satisfying assignment and U set no is the set of all Boolean formula that have no satisfying assignment or in other words it is unsatisfiable. So U set no is the same as the no part of SAT. U set yes is not the same as yes part of SAT but it is a subset of that. right? So U set no is the same as unsatisfiable. Right? So we are given this promise that it is this it has a unique satisfying assignment or no satisfying assignment. So this is why it is called a promise problem. So, right, this is why it is called a promise problem. Right? So we are when you are given the, the language, you the language comes with the promise. So so that is why it is called a promise problem. Okay. So you may think perhaps it is easier to decide this problem because it comes with a certain promise and per perhaps that it makes it easier. And what we will see in the next lecture is the theorem by Valiant and Vazirani, right? I think somewhere in the mid 80s maybe 83, I do not know, mid 80s sometime, uh, maybe I will just say mid 80s. that suppose there was a polynomial time algorithm for unique set. So, not, so when I say polynomial time, uh, we cannot say U set is in P because U set is not really a language, right? A language is just a subset. So the yes instances are in the subset, no instances are not in the subset. So I should actually say, strictly speaking, I should say U set is in promise P, okay, not P. So it should be promise P. Right. Suppose U set is in promise P. So promise P is just the promise version of polynomial time. In that case, then NP will be equal to RP. So NP and RP we already know. So this, so NP being equal to RP is kind of not believed to be true. People think that NP is more powerful than RP. So what in Overall, what it is saying is that if U set has a polynomial time algorithm, then N P equal to R P, which is something un, which is something that is a bit hard to believe, right? So we, we tend to think that uh, U set is does not have a polynomial time algorithm. The promise problem of U set is does not have a polynomial time algorithm. So there is some evidence that even when we restrict to this promise of SAT the Boolean formula that is given as a satisfiability instance, even when we restrict it to the case where the formula either has only 0 or 
one as one satisfying assignment not more even then it continues to be hard right so that is the valiant wazirani theorem right so in the next lecture i will we will see the proof of the valiant wazirani theorem and just to summarize uh, in this lecture we we saw what is syntactic and semantic classes so those syntactic classes are those for which a turing machine automatically corresponds to a certain language there is semantic it needs to satisfy some other conditions other properties to be a decider and bpp is a semantic class because of which there is no immediate bpp complete language right and then we define promise problem which was a generalization of languages because uh, uh because languages are just a subset of sigma star promise problem are like yes instance and no instance but this need not be uh, together this need not be a partition of sigma star there could be some that are neither in the yes or nor in the no instances we defined unique set which is set of all boolean formula that have exactly one satisfying assignment this is the yes unique set yes instance and the unsatisfiable boolean formula are the no instance right so and then we said that um, valiant wazirani's theorem says that it's unlikely that even this restricted uh, problem or even this promise problem has a uh, polynomial time algorithm and yeah with that i conclude this lecture and we'll see the proof of valiant wazirani theorem in the next thank you